Hi, my name is Robert Stack. And uh, recently in the Brattleboro Reformer, there have been a couple letters to the editors talking about Crystal Night. And this coming up is the 75th anniversary. And it, re it really got me thinking about it. In the, in the 1970s, I attended the University of Vermont, and I had the privilege and incredible educational experience of working, uh, learning from a teacher named Professor Roy Hilberg. And I had him for political science. But the thing that was a life-changing event for me is I took a seminar with him on the Holocaust. Uh, Professor Hilberg had written a, a three-volume set, Destruction of European Jewelry, back in the 1960s. And this was before everybody else was doing the Holocaust. I mean, this was just his life's work, if you will. And so I took a special seminar to combine the literature uh, along with the political science of the Holocaust. I mean, it was my privilege to hear Eli Wiesel uh, come and give a talk at the chapel at UVM, which was an incredible movie. I just published a book, Night, and it was a cold January night. I remember it was um, freezing, and he came in and, and he sort of limped. And if you read the night, you know that he hurt his foot and all kind of, and he got up there and he said how cold it was. And it was just an incredible experience. The other thing that was there was uh, we listened to an AP reporter, an AP reporter who was there who was present during Crystal Night. And one of the things that is happening now as years go by is that the eyewitnesses are dying. And it's the responsibility of the people who heard the eyewitnesses to continue to tell the story. And so I, I want to take this opportunity to share what I learned. A pogrom is a, a Russian word. It means riot. It means destruction. And, uh, and so the, during this period of time, 30,000 Jewish men were detained. Uh, many of them uh, were sent to concentration camps in Germany at the time, and they were only allowed to leave if they agreed to, mi to uh, migrate, to move out of Germany. And, but what was really terrible about it, and I, I just want to say, obviously, it was terrible for the, for the Jews. I mean, their synagogues were destroyed, their homes were ransacked, uh, their men were taken away in captivity. Uh, their business were destroyed. But what happened was that it backfired. It backfired on Germany. And, 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 and what happened was that, it, well, first of all, it was witnessed by these reporters. It was witnessed by people. And when they reported, it, it really fueled the anti-German sentiment. And, if, and it made boycotts more strenuous. And contracts were canceled. I mean, important international trade. Uh, remember, this is the Depression. People are trying to build up their country again and really backfired internationally. Even President Roosevelt, a week after the program, spoke about that in his radio address. But it, it, was, it really harmed that. And people within the Nazi, uh, who were busy with the rearmament and busy with trying to make uh, Germany strong again, were very, very upset that this was witnessed. And that, that was the problem. Not that it was done, but that it was witnessed and that other people found out about it. The other thing that happened was that most of the businesses were insured by German insurance companies because the Jews weren't allowed by that time to own uh, insurance companies. So they ended up with a bill, and I think the bill was something like 10 million uh, Deutschmarks or Reichsmarks and about 4 million American dollars and it, for all the broken property, for all the destroyed things. And it, and it also, and, and this is like something that people have to sort of come to think about it. It was like the good German, and I mean that in a, a good way. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean the good German people were really upset by what is happening in their, in their neighborhoods, in their cities. I mean, these were their neighbors. These were their friends. These were people they did business with. And they watched them being sort of destroyed and killed their businesses. And all this damage was sort of, um, I don't want to say distasteful, because that, that's kind of a weak word, but it was. Um, and, th and then also, they didn't know what, sh can the Jews, who were German citizens, have a right to bring charges against the looters? And they decided, no, that the looters were acting out of some vengeance, and you know, it was okay, because it was... And then there was a distort, what about Germans that committed crimes, like uh, murder or rape while this was happening? Well, that got a little bit trickier because they weren't sure how to do this. Now, if they did it out of revenge to, uh, to take care of the Jew, then it was okay. 
But, but if they did it for like their own purposes, like, uh, aim, like for moral crimes, then it wasn't okay. And this, this was always a problem for the Germans. They, they, they wanted to be righteous and moral, but at the same time they wanted to commit these horrible crimes against humanity. And of course, one of the ways they got around that was they made Jews less than human. And, and you always have to do that when you're going to kill somebody. Um, but so there was this sort of very strange aftermath. And Goebbels was really taking the task by all the other ministers that this was just a terrible idea and it was the wrong thing to happen. And, uh, and, and so I, I think on some level, it, a lot of people want to talk about it. That you know this was this was a, a program. This was the Crystal Night. I mean, I mean, even Crystal Night. Professor Hilberg had this wonderful thing. He says, "Here you are in the middle of the depression, and what they call it is that some broken glass. That the Jews had their crystal broken, as if like, who cares? You know? I mean, really, like literally. And and Professor Hilberg actually thought it was almost like an example of spin, if you will, that they they put this name on it." Um, when it was really about destruction and murder. Um, one of the things I do uh, when I've shared this with other folks over the years is that if you can imagine in Brattleboro, and I hope I don't offend anybody by this, but if you can imagine in Brattleboro if on a certain night in November, November 9th, people went out to the meeting place out in West Brattleboro and burned it down because they had Jewish services there. And then they went down to uh, Elliott Street and they found the dry cleaner's place and they destroyed that and took all the clothes out and broke all the clothes. And then they went out to Main Street and they found a jewelry shop that was owned and they ripped out the windows and burned that building and stole all the things. And then they went out to PNC and they attacked the bagel store and they ruined the place and they burned it to the ground and they went over to the drugstore and destroyed that. And this occurred over two, two or three days. And meanwhile, women were being raped, men were being detained, houses were being ransacked, uh, bonfires in the streets. It was, it was such a disaster. I mean, you know, if you can imagine somebody in Brattleboro, like three days later, November 10th or 11th, they walk out and they go, hey, what happened to my bagel store? Where's, my, where's the drug store? Wait a minute, I knew that guy. He's a nice guy. And this is really what happened. I mean, there were examples of, of men who were veterans of World War I who had earned the Iron Cross in battle. And, you know, and, and they were attacked. They were dragged out of their home and put in detention. And there was something about that that the German people didn't like. It was, it was like, it just wasn't right. And one of the things that happened, and this is where I, I, why I want to speak about it, really, is that the true significance of Crystal Night was the decision that from now on, what was going to be done to the Jews would be legal. And it would be done by decree. It would be done, and they would be careful. They would decide who was Jewish and who wasn't Jewish. And they would do it in a way that would maximize the benefit for the Third Reich. Now, in the beginning, before war broke out with the invasion of Poland, uh, it was all about forcing them to migrate. Get all their money, take as much money as you can, and then get them to leave the country. Of course, one of the problems was no other countries were accepting, uh, were giving visas. And, and the idea was at that point, and, and Dr. Hilberg, I mean, I love, you know, I can just visualize, he's a little short guy, he was wonderful, but... Uh, really conservative. And I was a liberal hippie and stuff, you know, I was a veteran. He loved me that I was a veteran because I read the newspaper. Um, but it, he, he said there was something about it. He says that, that once they decided that it wasn't allowed in Germany, once they decided we were not going to have riots in the street, we were not going to see broken glass. I mean, if you can imagine if uh, when the building was burning in West Brattleboro and the fire department, which was right at the bottom of the street, went up there and did not put out the fire. And all they did was make sure the fire didn't go any further. And if you can imagine walking downtown and seeing the windows broken on three or four different stores, a couple buildings burnt, and you realize, you go, this is not right. And that, so what happened, if I can say this right, hoodlums, um, what they called the brown shirts. And by the way, the brown shirts were never to be seen again. This was the end. This was their last hurrah. God, Google's never had power again. Um, from here on in, it was the SS. 
and it was the army. Um, what, what they said was now hoodlums could never have killed six million Jews. You could never have done that, but the state can. When the state married the Industrial Revolution, and why I say that is that you have to understand there was trains. There was trains that transported people. There was ghettoization. There were people that were moved in the middle of the war. What gets put on trains and what gets moved? Ornaments, manpower, all these decisions had to be made. And it was, even when the war was lost and they knew the war was lost, they continued to kill Jews. They continued to send people to, uh, to these killing camps. And, and so it, it, it was that moment why Crystal Night is so scary is that what they did, they said no longer will these be random acts of violence but this will be state sanctioned and we will do it in a way that we will eliminate the Jew from Germany. And once the borders were closed and they could no longer force them out of the country, that was the beginning of the annihilation and the murder of six million Jews. And so I think if, if people don't mind, I mean, the, I want to acknowledge that for the Jews that were harmed, during uh, Crystal Night or that program, that was a big deal. But the real big deal of it and the lesson to be learned from it was it wasn't just random acts of violence we almost can live with. I mean, I know that sounds horrible, but when the state sanctions violence, when state begins to decide that some segment of the population is less than, when they decide that something needs to be done to these people, this group of people, uh, that's when it becomes horrible. And the state may be slow, but it grinds. I mean, it just grows and it has a life of its own and people have regulations and they have like, here's how we're going to do it. And from there on in, as far as the Germans were concerned, they were being, the Jews were being resettled. And for the longest time, they would say, they're going to the east or they're going to work someplace. They're going, we're going to put them to work. Eichmann was just a bureaucrat. He had papers, he had codes, he had numbers, he had locations, he had camps, he had collection sites. I mean, you know, what they, what they did was first they had to identify who was Jewish, then they had to put stars on them, and then they had to put them in ghettos, and then they had to collect them and put them in a place, and then they had to figure out what to do with them. Send them to work camps, send them to the ovens, send them, you know, I mean, it was just, and it was all paperwork. It was, and the banality of evil, I think, is Hannah Arendt's uh, comment, you know. I mean, you don't quite understand what that means. I mean, it, what it means is the state did it. And the state did it through, you know, a goal, if you will. Uh, you know, and, and at one point, it sort of, people walked away from it, didn't pay attention to it. Everybody saw the cars go through. Everybody knew what was happening. But it's sort of, well, it's the state's doing it as if you don't take ownership for your own state. I mean, anyway, so it's like that. So I want to take this opportunity for those who have been listening to me. There's going to be an event in uh, Keene, and I'll, I'll repeat what's in the paper, but it's on uh, November, uh, November 7th, the Cohen Center for Holocaust and Genocide Studies at Keene State College, and the Colonial Theater will host uh, Keene's annual Crystal Night Remembrance. The remembrance is free and open to the public and will take place at 7 p.m. at the Colonial Theater on Main Street in Keene. Uh, and I, I would encourage everyone to go. Um, I want to hear it's a packed house. Um, you know, I grew up, I'm Irish Catholic, and you know, on St. Patrick's Day, you know, everybody wears green, and, uh, and, and you see the most ridiculous person say, well, everybody's Irish today, you know, as if, you know, that allows drunkenness or something. I don't know. But uh, um, I, I think it would be interesting if everyone said, today we're all Jewish. I think today, I think this November 9th, I might wear a star. 